this is Orinam Ghosh. I have already introduced myself uh, in the previous videos. Now let us uh, start with uh, the chapter 4, chapter 5 of Gulliver's Travels. Uh, I have already analyzed from uh, the book 2 of Gulliver's Travels from chapter 1 to 4 in the previous video, in the video lecture number 19 and uh, this particular fourth semester lecture number 4 and this is lecture number 5. So let us begin the book 2 of Gulliver's Travels, the, the chapter 5 of Gulliver's Travels. So in the previous chapters we have seen that the Gulliver's mishap continues because uh, there occurs a great rivalry between Gulliver and the court jester who is a dwarf. Now Queen's dwarf drops barrel sized apple on him in this particular chapter and hailstones as big as tennis balls batter and bruise him. So uh, uh, in the land of the Greek Brobdignagians, the natural phenomena is also big. Hailstone jakun porche akasteke borofer gola tar saizo pray almost as big as a tennis ball. So a bird of prey, uh, an eagle nearly grabs him and a spaniel picks him up in the mouth and carries him to the royal gardener. So all these uh, misoccurrences or mishappenings continue to Gulliver. Gulliver is uh, facing a lot of challenges in this huge land and Gulliver is insulted to be coddled and played with by the maids of the honor. This particular episode, maids of honor who are uh, actually uh, queen's uh, 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 assistants or queen's maids, they almost treated Gulliver like a toy and not as a man but as a toy. So they undress in front of him without any thought of modesty, which almost appears very repulsive to Gulliver. If they can a particular message or the sweet detachation, what is uh, the meaning of civilization? Shobhutar maniki. Shobhutar maniki shudu well decorative dress kora, apparel, the costume kora. Naki. Uh, to be civilized, you have to be civilized in your own manner. Uh, civilization mane ki shudhu matro bairir posha kasha na ki civilization mane aro onno kichu nije ke aro unno to kora habitat dikte ke vivinno tharoner various processes of harm manushe khoti kora judo bikro kora ekulo toke bilo thakar. Ita 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 mane ki shobhota. Ita prosno ekhane Jonathan Swift. A particular text through the constantly to the picture. So, because Gulliver is a sailor, the queen has a toy boat made of him and through which in which to sail. The royal ladies also take part in the game and make a big, brisk breeze with their fans. But that breeze uh, almost turns out to be storm for Gulliver, and disaster strikes when the frog hops into the in, in, into the particular can and nearly swamps Gulliver's boat. But Gulliver bravely drives the monster off with an oar. Remember, he is a great sailor. So one day a monkey seizes Gulliver and carries him to the top of the palace and Gulliver is finally rescued and when he recovers, is summoned by the king who is curious to know whether Gulliver was afraid. So Gulliver boasts that he could have protected himself with his own sword. And the king, of course, uh, goofos at the little splakna sprite. So the king is always taking a great uh, dose of humor in seeing uh, 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 the great pride of this very little man. And he thinks that, that the humans are very uh, prideful race. Some critical comments to make. Uh, regarding this chapter 5. Gulliver has begun to accept the Brobdignagian point of view, but Swift not let him forget that he is not a giant. And he may not adopt certain ideas of the giants, but once Gulliver begins to have pretensions, he is literally knocked down to size. Whenever Gulliver shows any form of pretension, Gulliver is knocked down and Gulliver is, uh, has been remembered about his size. Hitomar, not only your physical size, but also your moral size. The humiliating incidents multiply 
after a series of physical threats, Gulliver's emotional makeup is attacked, the maids of honor treat him as a plaything. But despite all, though, Gulliver is still tempted to brag about himself, he is still not aware that the giants are morally superior. After chapter 6, Gulliver will remain aware that they are much more morally superior than the human race. So this is another uh, picture portrait with Gulliver in the land of the Brobdingnagians. Chapter 6. In the chapter 6, Gulliver entertains himself and demonstrates his ingenuity by using the king's beard stubble to make a comb and by using strands of the queen's hair to make several chairs and a purse. Uh, Gulliver shows his uh, various ingenious skills. To the king and the queen, so Gulliver got on egg ball. So, in the same way, Queen's hair pin the shape that we get on a table along chair one at In addition, Gulliver plays spinet piano for the king and the queen by using sticks formed as card gills to bang on the keys as he runs up and down on a piano bench. So, using uh, uh, the various uh, sticks, uh, 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 various hair pins of the uh, uh, of the queen, Gulliver is using those things as scratch and almost he runs up and down through the entire piano bench to play the piano. The king also holds several audiences with Gulliver to discuss the culture of Gulliver's home country. So, king here will organize various uh, short cultural sessions, various short discussion sessions regarding Gulliver's home country, England. And in these audiences, as requested by King, Gulliver explains the role of the people in the operation of the government, in religion, and in the legal system, among other topics. So there he talks about how English or the British administration operates, what is uh, how the judiciary operates, how the executive, how the administrative sector operates. The King, after asking many questions related to all that Gulliver tells him, concludes this audience with a summary and an assessment of what he hears. Finally, King gives the conclusion by assessing the entire English governmental system. King after last year, Shiddhan Krito, hey, 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 Galiver, bollo, hale, bapata, danache, hey. Kintu, adho ki King, kono bhabe, kono bhalo kata bolto, Galiver's travel se, bolto na, about the uh, English system. So, in this chapter, Swift changes his focus to the European politics and the institutional morality. The king is the questioner, while Gulliver is the expert who will answer back. King is the questioner, the personal question. And immediately we sense that what Gulliver says is completely naive. He is idealizing his country's customs and institutions. He even lies about them. He is telling lies and king will soon discover this. His distortion, therefore, is revealing and it exposes the actual workings of the English system. And besides attacking the English as a whole, Swift singles out the Whigs in particular. So when the king asks whether the lords are advanced because of achievement or from political convenience, the reference is to the Whigs, buying votes in parliament by granting nobility to politicians. So by granting various forms of titles to politicians, they are buying politicians. The weak votes. So when the king asks when bishops are ever appointed because of their political opinions, the reference is again to the Whigs. Bishop that ke ki appoint kar hai the Rajanoitik opinion hai jonno. Religion among politics ki interconnected in England. Who appointed writers of their party to the bishoprics? Conversely, clerical success was denied Swift largely because of his political opinions. So when the king asks whether members of the parliament are not sometimes elected by bribery or influence, the allusion is to Walpole. Robert Walpole, the first prime minister of England, to bribery and influence, who is a master at reading elections. And when the king asks whether judges don't sometimes get rich 
and dispense partial and slow justice, swift inference is that justices of the peace are usually stupid and biased and the judges in the higher courts are notoriously slow and usually very weak. So Swift is questioning all forms of administrative machineries of England, the judiciary, the executive, the administration, the theological experts, the priests, the justices, everything. And Swift has Gulliver invoke the rhetoricians before he begins praising England. Then he connects this highly formal invocation with the ludicrous spectacle of Gulliver proudly banging on the piano with mallets. So here Swift is visually building up a, a, a very incongruent picture that Gulliver uh, is bragging, this very small human being is bragging in front of the far more morally superior race, the Brobignagians, about the English system, about the British politics. She constantly brag poche, she constantly gorbita uh, hoche, uh, uh, At the same time, she vidad or piano or mudhe, crotch niye, mallet and motokore, hammer and motokore, chute dure barache. So, kibabe, he becomes uh, a bat of ridicule, uh, an instrument of entertainment, a court jester, and at the same time, a very prideful man. A incongruous uh, at a admixture of a particular context. Bar bar bola chesta question. Jonathan Swift. So also Swift uses insect imagery to surround the discussion of the morality of Europe. Gulliver even brags that bees and ants have a reputation for sagacity. The bees and the ants have a reputation for being sagacious. That is means uh, that, that means being wise. And Gulliver's praise rings almost hollow. The king tells his pin-sized performer that English history is not as Gulliver describes. Rather, it's a heap of conspiracies, rebellions, very important words, murders, massacres, revolutions, banishments, the very worst effects that abrise faction, hypocrisy, perfidiousness, cruelty, rage, madness, hatred, envy, lust, malice or ambition could produce. So the king clearly says that English politics is full of hypocrisies, rebellions, murders. Kun, jokum, rebellion, a revolution that bought the English history. And we see Edward II, Edward II was being, has been murdered, was murdered by younger Moti Mahatma, poor Chotama, the syllabus about the semester two day. But with the reformation in history, that uh, King Charles I has been beheaded, had been beheaded by uh, uh, Oliver Cromwell. And then there occurs uh, 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 Henry VIII, who murdered many theologians, many priests in the name of the British Reformation, British Anglican Church, Anglican Protestant Church. So English history is full of massacre, glorious revolution. It's all about uh, English is also about rebellion, conspiracy, and full of hypocrisy, perfidiousness, cruelty, rage, madness, paglamo, rag, kingsha, hatred, jigangsha, of course, ambition. Macbeth is an example of that. Jekono Rashtro, Jekono Rashtra Ritihashi is history of rage, madness, cruelty, hatred. A particular context, Swift English monarchy, English history, and he concludes that the bulk of Gulliver's countrymen are the most pernicious race of odious little Barmin that nature ever suffered to crawl upon the surface of the earth. This is a very important word, very important for five marks question. The most pernicious race of odious little varmin that nature ever suffered to crawl upon the surface of the earth. Amon actor race, human ra, the most pernicious race of odious little varmin. Varmin is a kind of insect, gubre pokarmoto, race, humanity. A statement 
that is not only the most famous statement in the Gulliver's Travels, that is perhaps the most famous in all literature in its assessment of the nature of mankind. So, Swift had a, a, a misanthropic nature that he hates human being. So, the particular line the clearly reflected. Now, let us move into chapter 7 of Gulliver's Travels. Gulliver decides that the king's lack of enthusiasm for England springs from his ignorance of the country. It might be that, uh, that uh, uh, the Brobdingnagian king do not know about the English kingdom. So to remedy his ignorance, Gulliver offers to teach the king about the England's magnificence. So he decides to teach uh, the, uh, the Brobdingnagian monarch about the great magnificence of the English empire. The first lesson concerns one of England's most valuable assets, and that is gunpowder. Kamon kore gunpowder, which is my name, Agronet Dajjo Bostu, jadi ek apun kar dene guri chhoda hota, judho kora hota. So describing its effects graphically and at great length, how this gunpowder is a great boon to humanity. Gulliver tells the king that gunpowder would be a great boon for him also. With it, the king could reduce all his subjects to slavery. So this is a very important uh, portion of Gulliver's travels, where Gulliver is talking about the power politics, power dynamics, that king can reduce all his subjects to slave. Through which instrument? Through the instrument of fear. Through using this particular instrument of gunpowder, Gunpowder to the boy, the key, Kamon Kore, subject, slave, Rupan Kori, the Kotai. So, this is a very imperialist notion that Gulliver is propounding. And we should remember that Gulliver is standing against this form of imperialistic perspective in the book one of Gulliver's Travels, when he completely rejects the proposal of the Lilliputian king regarding colonizing uh, the Blefus Kurian Empire. He himself said that he will not colonize the Blefus that he will not act as an agent of the emperor to colonize Blefuscu. Blefuscu will colonize Korbena Chaili, Kortavat to Vidar, Chihara, like John Manush. In a particular boy, quite strangely, Gulliver becomes completely a different man. He is rather advising the king to use gunpowder so that he can reduce all his subjects to slavery and can even expand his empire. The king is horrified by the suggestion. He rejects such a bloodthirsty and inhuman proposal, warning the important and groveling insect Gulliver that he will be executed if he ever mentions the gunpowder again. He said that he will be executed. Gulliver pran nehabe, he will be beheaded. If Gulliver once again talk about this form of using gunpowder as a ploy to colonize all the subjects. So Gulliver drops the subject of gunpowder and gives us an account of the customs and government of his host. Brobdingian army is a national guard of the military. Now the perspective, the point of view changes. Gulliver now uh, do not uh, 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 describe the, uh, the various uh, occurrences of his own land. But rather, he now talks about his host's government. That is the Brobdingnagian government. The Brobdingnagian army is a national guard or militia. There are no professional soldiers in that Brobdingnagian army. As for government, it is extremely simple. There are no refinements, mysteries, intrigues, or state secrets. So there is no uh, uh, enigma regarding uh, various form of military or state decision, no state secret. Government depends upon common sense, mercy, and swift justice. Brobdingnagian learning consists only of morality, history, poetry, and practical mathematics. The Brobdingnagians cannot understand abstract reasoning and idea. 
their laws must contain only 22 words oneki bolen american constitution khubi bikkhat constitution because matro 13 14 bata lekha indian constitution khub boro constitution to sei proshno to onno proshno american constitution e prottekta state i alada alada constitution royeche oneke bole oneki motamo je brief oye te jodi law ke byakha kore ami jani na brief oye te law ke byakha kore jay na jay kina this is sweeps completely partial viewpoint that laws must contain very precise few words and laws must contain only 22 words and must be absolutely clear their libraries are small and their books are written in clear and transparent style so a description about the brabdignagir empire chapter 7 of gulliver's travels our there which so swift shows us that gulliver's character seems to be changing for the worse beginning of, uh, in the land of the lilliput gulliver was a different being altogether Gulliver there resists various forms of corruptions. He resists all forms of colonialism there. He resists the uh, idea of the emperor regarding colonizing the Blefuscu. He denies it. But in this particular book, his pride is growing to enormous proportions. He becomes condescending to the king. He calls king a nobody and says that the king's standards are not worthy of emulation. Emulation means imitation. But great allowances should be given to king who lives wholly secluded from the rest of the world and must therefore be altogether unacquainted with the manners and customs that most prevail in other nations. So king should know all the customs that are uh, uh, very popular in other nations. The want of which knowledge will ever produce many prejudices and a certain narrowness of thinking narrowness of thinking narrow thinking narrow narrow so and a certain narrowness of thinking from which we the England and the politer countries of Europe are wholly exempted. Amre shottake bai. Amre English tonic superior. So he then waxes patriotic and political over European morality, mentioning Dionysius of uh, of Halicarnus. So Dionysius of Halicarnus, amyaina, it a mythological figure of the Dionysius kina, perhaps an imaginary figure. So, Gulliver also sneers at the king's idea that government should be compounded of common sense, justice, mercy, and understandable laws. So, Gulliver at the same time sneers at the king. The government should be a compound mixture of common sense, justice, rationality, mercy. So instead of censoring the Whigs, most of the Swiss allusions in this particular section draw attention to the English intellectual follies. Gulliver remarks that he could not teach the giants to think in abstractions and transcendentals. Instead, their thinking was always clear. So Swift was always against uh, uh, philosophical abstraction thinking. Abstract thinking, amon chinta jeta bimuto chinta jeta dhora jayna, transcendental thinking, that is what we should do. A man of logic and reason, jeva be transparent with the administration move kore, shiva be tini move korte kochon na korte. He was not a creature of imagination. So, this observation has already uh, been discussed in Swift's another very famous book called The Battle of the Books. There already modern among entry and the debate at it can only abstract thinking care completely deny question against the question. So Swift's mention of the giants who preceded the smaller Brobdingnagians reminds us that the Brobdingnagians are not perfect, but they are consistently moral. So Brobdingnagians are a uh, Brobdingnagian country is a moral utopia. What is utopia? Mentioned by Thomas More's uh, 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 
Moore's book called Utopia. Utopia is an ideal or perfect kingdom. Perfect kingdom where everybody is equal. It's a socialist system. It's basically a socialist system where everybody is uh, everybody is equal. Everybody is treated as equal. So now moving on to the last chapter. So chapter 7 is actually very important. Here a king critics the entire British political system and through this the mouthpiece of King and through Gulliver using Gulliver as a device uh, Swift is also critiquing the the entire English monarchical system the entire English executive and judiciary system chapter 8 Gulliver spends two years in Brobdingnag but he is not happy despite the royal family's pamphlet so he spends two years in Brobdingnag. He is afraid that he will never escape and will turn into a sort of domestic alibi royal pet. So escape seems almost impossible. Chance, however, intervenes on a trip to the seashore. An eagle swoops down. Eagle, King, So in the seashore. A uh, chance in a chance in a, in a coincidence, Eagle swoops down, snatches up the box Gulliver travels in and drops it into the sea. And the box is driven by the wind close to an English ship and inspired by some sailors who retreat Gulliver and his positions. So Gulliver does not adjust easily to his fellow Englishmen. After living two years in a land of giants, he has convinced himself that all Englishmen are meat gates. So this is the message of the book, that all the Englishmen are basically meat gates. Meat gates means small, very small size human being. And everything looks tiny back home and he feels like a giant in the home. In time, Gulliver's sense of perspective heals. Gulliver's sense of perspective at a moral utopia, moral giants, the Shanghai Kati, Gulliver perspective on Puri Bottom. I mean, the book four Puri Ekamaboje in the land of the Huims, those who are moral horses, uh, far superior than the human being. I mean, the Ekamaboje Gulliver took England a field of human being the Shanghai Shanghai Kati. Horse their dresses from the Shanghai Kati, Bari Dasta Voliki Shanghai Kati. For the perspective, and a time, he could a time through the perspective change high that author book eight. So, some critical points regarding book eight. In this particular book, Swift reinforces the idea of the giant's moral superiority by having Gulliver identify the English with the Lilliputians. Now, this association also makes Gulliver very ridiculous because it demonstrates the folly and the self deception. The Gulliver practices in identifying himself with the moral giants. Swift dramatizes this with the with the mirror Gulliver cannot be here to look into. The mirror is a standard device just as a satire is. So satire is almost like a mirror. The Tomar Dike Ayanata Dekhe Dakate Dako Tumi Hotche with Druper Bostu. Mijake Dako along the Kesheko Oh Englishmen Bojo Tomade Doshkulo Kotakota. So the mirror is a standard device, just a satire is anyone who looks closely is shown his own flaws. So Swift has finished his commentary on the human morality. In Gulliver's next voyage, he trains his satire on people's internet, how they use and misuse it. So, so this is uh, the book eight of the Gulliver's Travels. Now, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the book two of Gulliver's Travels, the chapter eight. So uh, uh, I have uh, analyzed you all the, uh, I, I, I've summarized all the book chapters of Gulliver's Travels, first two books. And I've also analyzed uh, uh, and critically comment on these chapters. Now, uh, let us move into the character of Captain Lemuel Gulliver, which is shown uh, in this particular text. 
as we all this is very important for our 10 marks question now as you all know that uh, captain lemuel galiver is a, a a kind of british sergeant a english sergeant born in nottinghamshire and uh, 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 and uh, he is the undistinguished third of the five sons of a man of very modest means he was born in nottinghamshire a serious country without any eccentricity without any imagination he attended emmanuel college a respected but not dazzling school the neighborhoods that galiver lived in old jury fetcher lane wapping are all lower middle class sections so he is in fact mr british middle class of his time so captain lemuel galiver who is a doctor who is a surgeon who is a medi medical professional he is a representative middle class of his time ekjon british amra bolte pari ekjon british amaderi moto middle class e belong kora ekjon manush so galiver is also as might be expected galiver as i already said the galiver is galiver he believes what he is told he is an honest man and he expects others to be honest this expectation makes for humor and also for irony galiver is gullible nature tar irony er karon the result is a series of astonishingly detailed dead pan scenes for example when galiver awakens in lilliput he gradually discovers moving from one exact detail to another there is a prisoner of men who is at 6 inches tall so galiver jokhon prothom bar lilliput e deshe giye bondi holo to aba je 6 inch lokera ekta boro danob ke bondi kore feleche to ei je tar je surprise tar je uncertain jaygay pora eigulo prottektai galiver ke middle class manush hisebe age middle class ideal british representative hisebe reveal korche so in the book 2 Uh, in the land of the brobdingnag galiver is still an ordinary moral man but brobdingnagians are a moral giant so ekane contrast hoyeche the galiver becomes a british english citizen while on the other hand brobdingnagians are far more superior than galiver himself ebong shekhane partokko toiri hoyeche galiver ke jon chotto sartho sarthanneshi manush hisebe galiver protiponno hoyeche ei particular text e jodi ami agei bolechi Uh, galiver book one uh, he is resisting all forms of imperial uh, colonization uh, by resisting not to colonize the land of the blefuscu while uh, in this particular text he is advising the king to embrace gunpowder as a means of uh, uh, transforming his subjects to slaves so for the first time we see galiver as the hypocrite in this particular text in the book two he lies to the brobdingnagian king in order to conceal what is despicable about his native england galiver's moral height can never reach that of the brobdingnagians and swift reinforces the idea of the giants moral superiority by having galiver identify the english with the lilliputians so while in the book 1 swift tries to identify the english with the lilliputian in the book 2 galiver has been identified with the lilliputian because shekhana tar onno keu nei the english ke represent korbe but brobdingnagian ra ekhane ideal human race so galiver's pride is at the root of his trouble and swift dramatizes this with the mirror galiver cannot bear to look into amon ekta mirror jekhane galiver nije ke dekhte pacche na brobdingnagian mirror birat boro mirror nije ke dekhte pacche na mane nije ke chintei pacche as an englishman nijer follies nijer uh, pride recognize hi korte pachhe na gali so thank you for this fifth video uh, uh, i end this video here in the next video i'll discuss various important themes of uh, 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 of galiver struggles so a particular video te ami dutu chapter the ekta uh, book tour from chapter 5 to chapter Eight for the film. I have ended the text of Galiver's Travels. A poorer section, a poorer video. Then, I mean, Galiver's Travels are only good theme. Near to all, just like what are the important themes? And I also discuss about the questions and answers. Galiver's Travels is very important. Thank you.